the title of this message is God's Guardrails. God's Guardrails. And you know, if, if you're on a highway, actually I've seen some rather scary ones. With these, they have guardrails, these highways are winding down this mountain. I remember one, and you think, if you go over the side, it's like a thousand foot drop. And they got these guardrails, so if the truck gets a little out of control of the car, you run against this guardrail and the scraping will wake you up and you'll go back and, or hopefully, depending on speed and height, you won't tip over and, and crash. And on bridges, they have guardrails. At least they make it difficult for somebody to fall off, jump off. Um, and there are you know, guardrails for people who um, clean high buildings on the, those little things that platforms take them up and down. Guardrails are for safety, to save lives. Well, God has spiritual guardrails. And the spiritual guardrails are to protect our relationships with God. If we are born, and we all agree, we're born to be in the family of God. That's our purpose. I'm not taking anything away from all the other purposes people have, you know, to be a good spouse and live a good life. But really, all those things come and go. You know, you all got to, I mean, we all are going to get old and pass away somewhere. And then you're going to look back and say, well, what was it all about? It's all about getting into God's family. So the most important thing is our relationship with God. Or like if you're a truck and you go over the guardrail, you drop to a thousand feet death. Well, guardrails are to keep us in line with God because that is the most important thing. You could even argue that death in this life is not as important as committing the unpardonable sin as far as God is concerned and losing out what they call the second death and never making it into God's family. So spiritual guardrails are actually more important than physical guardrails, you know, uh, going off the road and whatever. I even like the fact that in Illinois, a lot of roads, they put this little hash thing. When you get off the road, your tire makes extra noise. You know, get back in the center. You're going, you know, you're getting off the line. Those guardrails are good. They protect our relationship with God. And that's our number one purpose. Our number one purpose is to be with God. Now, I want to look at this Christmas season. And I know you're thinking, oh, I don't want to hear any more about it. But I want to make a point that I hopefully will be helpful to us. During this Christmas season, um, we're going to be around a lot of pagan influences, but mostly the society in general, more than us. And we should understand that the things that God tells people to do or not to do are our guardrails. One of the th number one things God said was to avoid pagan influences. And, and I'm going to go, I'm going to put it in my own words, but the first commandment basically says, put no God before the true God, you know. I guess we could use the English translation of his name, Jehovah. Put no God before Jehovah, or the God of the Bible, the God of creation. Don't put anything before him. And, and God is jealous. You know, the one thing you can say about God, he's jealous when Israel would go to foreign gods, and see gods or the no gods, and really if you go to 1 Corinthians 10, you realize Paul said, yeah, a lot of those pagan temples, demons are really behind a lot of that stuff. You can see it in some religions like voodoo. The point I'm making, though, is to any pagan influences, even those that don't seem so bad, are still not good for us or good for society because you're getting things that are connected with paganism that God does not like. And you're getting over the guardrail. Now most of us won't have any trouble with putting no other God before the true God. And the second commandment says, don't make images, period, of anything. Even if you think you know what God looks like or symbols for God, God says don't use it. And I'm gonna, uh, want something that GTA once said. He says, God can be as big as he wants to be or as small as he wants to be. And actually God said that when they were building the temple. He says, really, no temple can hold him. Not really. And not that he didn't agree to let David build him a temple, but the reality is no temple can really hold God. Um, and, you know, we think about little things as being unimportant, but you realize that at a micro 
level and in a subatomic level, that's where a lot of the power of the universe is. God could be small enough to mess with that stuff. Remember, we were discussing it last week, and we said uh, the sun gave up his godly powers and became a microscopic, at least you can't see with a bare eye, um, sperm so he could become a regular human being and be born like we're born. And that's a miracle that's hard for us to believe, but God can be as little as he wants or as big as he wants. I mean, God could grab, he could be big enough, if he, I mean, he could do it with his spiritual power and throw the moon out back in the space if he wanted to, a big object like that. And so no image can really picture God. I think God is beyond the human mind's artistic efforts. And to keep that in mind, now the reason I'm mentioning that is God says anything that pulls us in the pagan, representing God, image direction, pulls us and society away from God. And I know what everybody's thinking. Well, but Christmas is only a partial compromise, and that's true. And there are a lot of beautiful music. And, and there is beautiful music. By the way, some of it, like uh, Oh Holy Night, probably would be more appropriate if we sang it in the fall, because that's probably... I, we talked about that in the podcast, so I won't repeat it all again. I hope some of you heard it. But the, the evidence is clear that Christ was born in the fall. Uh, we Actually, we said this before the program. We didn't nail it down. Probably Feast of Trumpets, possibly Day of Atonement. But regardless, he was born in the fall. And probably that song, it was a holy night when Christ was born. And, and what Luke describes in chapters 1 and 2 and it's also in, in Matthew is a, is a nice thing. But take something innocent like the Christmas tree. Uh, we discussed that a little bit too. And you're going to say, but it's so beautiful. And they, decor they decorate it. I'm not going to read the scripture in Jeremiah, but you all know the scripture, Jeremiah 10 and 7, where they, they nail this tree and they decorate it and they put a little base so it can't move. And, and it's, it's not a Christmas tree, but it's, it and the Christmas tree have common roots. The roots are in paganism, Christmas worship. And you're going to say, well, how is that a worshiping a tree? We don't think of it that way, but God does. He remembers the original meaning, and it's not good for the public to get close to that stuff. I know you're all there, but it's so pretty. The star and the angel on top. And so I, I <clears throat> anyway, I'm going to read Jeremiah 25, 6 and 7. We're not going to go through all the scriptures you're normally expecting, because I want to make a point that I'm, as I get older, I'm starting to really learn it. It takes, I'm kind of slow down the uptake. Uh, Jeremiah 25, 6 and 7. Jeremiah says, well, God is saying it through him. Do not go after other gods to serve them and worship them. And do not provoke me to anger, that is, you know, God, with the works of your hands. You know, they, they made idols. Actually, when you read the prophets, God actually makes fun of them. He says, you cut down a, a tree Part of it you use for firewood to cook your bread, and part of it you use to make an idol. <laughs> they can't really do anything, and you worship it. How stupid is I mean, God actually says that in, um, in at least two of the prophets. Um, and it <clears throat> with the works of your hands, and I will not harm you, yet you, yet you have not listened to me. In other words, this is not going to go well getting on the bad side of God, says the Lord, that you might provoke me to anger with works of your hands. And then he says something interesting, to your own hurt. And this is mentioned several times in the Bible, that it's not just you have to worry about God. Anytime you do ungodly things, it hurts you. It hurts your society. It hurts your family. And I think people don't realize that. I'm starting to see it now in more things like young people are giving up on marriage. And I won't go into all the reasons why I blame it on judges and society, a whole bunch of stuff. I, so I understand they're saying it, but you know that's hurting society, don't you? And they're, they're undermining with women through radical feminism, motherhood. Do you realize that's hurting society? Um, and then they have clever arguments. Well, it is better than just taking care of kids. Well, that's actually the most important thing, but we'll get off on that topic. But the point I'm making is 
everything God forbids is bad for us. In other words, he's telling Israel, you're actually hurting yourself by messing with all this pagan stuff. We all know that Xmas was a pagan compromise from Constantine. And I have the uh, paper, and I'll bring copies next week remind them, that we got from, uh, <clears throat> from Jack, where Constantine decided that he needed help ruling the Roman Empire. And Christianity had a lot of oomph. It was really, people were really picking up on it and dropping paganism for it. And he realized Christianity can help me. But the, but the pagans don't want to give up their paganism. So I'll blend the two religions into one new one, the universal, that's what Catholic means, universal church. I'll call the empire now the Holy Roman Empire. And he was actually head of the church. He didn't live that long after all that, but he was. Um, and we're going to all the details, but. And the reason they picked December 25th was that was the day of Saul Invictus the invincible sun, the sun god. So basically, the people of Rome didn't have to give up their sun worship celebration. They just renamed it. They relabeled it. Can you see how clever that was for Constantine? And maybe he, you know, maybe he convinced himself it was the right thing. You get, you know, who knows? Um, through some of the private things he said, probably not. But it worked. It helped him rule the empire. And by the way, ever since then, historically, to the extent that they're able to do it, the worst dictators use religion and government together to rule the people. And just think about examples. I'm not just, by the way, the Holy Roman Empire, if you read history of Western civilization, they had their ups and downs a lot. But they, up until really, um, to Britain kind of became the dominant power after uh, the Spanish fleet, the Armada, was sunk. They had a lot of power in Europe. And even up until the Napoleonic days, they were a major factor in Europe. You'll see them on maps in the center of Europe. Uh, but the point I want to get at is, and a lot of leaders got people and the church to tell people, worship the leader. You know, when they said, hail Caesar, um, well, Constantine started, but maybe Caesar's the most famous. They were literally worshiping Caesar. Can you think that? I mean, yes, they combined paganism and politics, and it worked. But was it good for society? It wasn't. I'm going to tell you a story. I got a nice job at the phone company when I got out of the Army, and it was, um, it was a nice manager job. It wasn't really my type of job, but anyway, I remember... Um, Somewhere about December 10th or so, we had a meeting with the, all the young ladies. Back then, they operated the phones with you know, little things and the plugs and all those things. This was 1968, 69. So phones were operated that way. And they told all the young operators, all young women, well, some were middle-aged women too. They told the women, they said, uh, we were like four blocks off State Street in Chicago a little bit south of the middle of Chicago. So they had to walk four blocks, get to State Street, to get buses and trains back home. And they, they said, the Christmas season is the most dangerous season for you. Now, the way I remember it, they gave them instructions on how to carry their purse. And I guess you couldn't carry it like this because it's easy for people to grab it and run. You got to sling it this way. A whole lot of and go together and safety instructions. And as it got darker and darker when they got off work, they were in more danger during Christmas than any time of the year. And I remember this statement. They told them, if some thug gets a hold of your purse in spite of you hold it the more secure way, don't resist because you could get killed. In other words, Christmas was dangerous to the workers. And I'm making this up. And after Christmas is over, the danger kind of subsided. People wanted money. Well, I, I, can you imagine beating a woman, in some cases half to death, to get money out of her purse to go Christmas shopping? That almost sounds obscene when I say it. But that's really, I'm not making this up. That's really what was happened. It was, a, it was a dangerous run for those women to get to the bus. I assume they were safe when they got on the bus, though I'm not certain about that either. There's some stories, but more so. And like the criminals knew, Phone company women get off 
Here's where, you know, and they were like predator, like wolves waiting. Um, and this time of year is often dangerous. I'll talk about that more later. What I'm saying is the paganism that Constantine brought into Christianity that is big this time of year is not good for society. Apart from the fact that God gets angry about it, it's bad for us. Um, there are more alcohol-related problems, and you probably know some of those stories. So God will um, should not it being ignored. I talked to two of my aunts, and I you know, gave a pretty good reason why Christmas is not biblical. And one said, I don't care. <laughs> she didn't deny what I said was accurate. She probably learned debating me with me over those issues was a losing cause. I'm my opinion, but she didn't care. Everybody else keep it, so I'll keep it till it. And I think the second one, it was something like, well, I don't know if you're right or not, James Earl. That's what they all called me when I was a kid. Um, but so you're going to keep doing it anyway. So what can I tell you? It's like it's there, and there's not much we can do about it, right? But at least we can know that it's not good for society. Um, people don't know it, and they probably won't believe you if you tell them. Because the music is the time of love family fellowship. And there are some good charities. Let me also give credit to the Salvation Army from what I have seen over the years, including the one in Cape Girardeau. The Salvation Army <clears throat> does go into the poorest parts of the world. Actually, they were started in London to go into the ghettos for that reason. They do that in America and they do help. So I am. So if you want to put a dollar in the kettle when you go to the store, I'm not against it. As a charity, they probably do do good things. I hope this doesn't confuse anybody. <laughs> so I, I'm not saying that the charity work is bad, but I'm saying that overall, the influence is bad on society, and it pulls people further and further and further away from God. They don't know it. If you tell them, they probably won't believe you. Oh, you're just you're always off on something, James. Or this is not. You know, they don't care. At least that's what I've heard. Um, in the Britannica 11th edition, um, even uh, Christian theologian Origen said that Christmas was sinful, 245 AD. And many Christians, even at that point, you know, they was being pushed by certain elements. They didn't go for it. I, I realized that Constantine made it legal and the thing of the, of the whole Roman Empire, but a lot of people knew that it was pagan. Do you know that when the Puritans came to America, and most of the pilgrims, especially in New England, were Puritans. They poured over once they got established. They were very biblical. Actually, they stopped keeping Christmas in England for a while. And that's why the Christmas Carol book was so important. It was a book written by English people who didn't like all the stuff the Puritans were doing, and they wanted to get back to their big Christmas parties. Anyway, uh, bah humbug, but the book was meant, just like movies are, to influence public opinion, and Charles Dickinson did it. But the point I make, when the Puritans came to America, they were free from uh, the Church of England, a lot of those restrictions, they went as they perceived it, full biblical, no Christmas. It was outlawed. Um, to my understanding, up until about 1848, that, not that many Americans kept Christmas. In 1848, the Irish, potato famine, and a bunch of problems in Germany happened, and a bunch of those refugees from Ireland and Germany poured into America. Most were Catholic or um, Lutherans who were big into Christmas. Prior to that, Christmas was just not around in America. And I, and I said this in the podcast, you know, the Americans were losing the American Revolution because the British and their hired German warriors had a better army, better equipment, had a fleet. George Washington had a ragtag army, was losing. If you watch all the battles, lose, 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 they're pushed down out of New York. They took New York, Manhattan, New Jersey, all the way down to, they had to cross um, the, the Delaware River. And they were freezing ragtag army, and support was drying up. And Washington, because the colonials didn't keep Christmas, and he knew that the people from Europe were, 
and then they would be drunk and hangovers, he did his Trenton attack. Because the other side was drunk and hangovers, he won a big victory. And that victory was a turning point in the war because he just needed a victory to get Americans to start contributing. I think they got like 15,000 volunteers. It was, I'm not saying other battles weren't big, but it was the turning point, the Christmas attack, Trenton, New Jersey. So you could say maybe America became the greatest nation in the world for two reasons, because the founders didn't keep Christmas. And they founded a nation that became the greatest nation in the world, and George Washington used that for victory um, in the American Revolution. But the point I want to make, everything God says that he forbids you to do is bad for you. America was blessed because, at least for a good while, it was not big into Christmas. I just make the statement. Some will argue, well, does it really make a difference? I think it does make a difference. Um, they were more biblical, certainly, than probably any other substantial place in the world during those days. And America's become the, the most powerful nation in the world, the greatest economy. That tells me we're getting God's blessing, and they were doing something right. And I know they're now telling the history that America's all bad. Well, that's just not historically accurate, but I know our education system is perverted. And everything God says to do is good for us. It's for our benefit. God wants us to worship him deeply and in truth, in spirit and truth. John 4.22 to 4.24. John 4.22. You worship what you do not know. He's talking to a Samaritan. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. And by the way, the Jews preserve the Old Testament, the, the sacred calendar, and they run it. And they have done a great job of it. We have to acknowledge that. And other things. So they had, and of course, Christ was a major rabbi. And so, um, and he kept all the Jewish stuff. And so truth was with them. Um, but the hour is coming, and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father seeks such to worship him. In a way, he's saying, even though the Jews have the oracles of truth, the Old Testament, they're not really worshiping him, at least most of them, in spirit and truth. God is spirit, verse 24, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. So we have to get pure as we can away from pagan compromises to worship God in spirit and in truth. Now, Mark 7, 6, we realize that he also criticized the Jewish people, even though they have the oracles of God and, and the truth. Um, Christ said in Mark 7, 6, he answered and said to them, well, did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites? He's talking to the religious leaders of, of Judah. As it is written, the people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In other words, there are a lot of religious people saying a lot of religious stuff, even today, but is their heart really with God? I'm not, I'm not saying they're totally insincere. They may be truly deceived. By the way, a lot of leaders who study biblical history and theology, they actually know that Christmas came from Constantine, that it's not in the Bible. Now, maybe the people don't, a lot of the leaders do, but they don't, I don't think they really care, truth be told. Verse 7, and in vain, I want to emphasize the word vain, verse 7, in vain, that means futility, stupidity. It's not going to work. It's going to frustrate you. In vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. In another place he says the traditions of men. Because Bill O'Reilly loves Christmas. He said, regardless of whether it's biblical or not, O'Reilly said, but it's a great human tradition. And as a Catholic, I understand what he's saying. Um, but Jesus warned that tradition might pull you away from God. And remember, anything that pulls us away from spiritually worshiping God is not good for us. Even apart from what God may or may not do to you, it's not good for us or good for society. Now, I'm going to tell this stupid, corny joke, but I kind of make a point. It's called the four-year ceiling. A young woman pursuing a graduate degree in art history had a chance to go to Italy for a few weeks to study. She was taking care of her grandmother. 
and she couldn't get any of the other relatives to help her with the grandmother, so she took her grandmother with her. So they went to Italy, and they went to the Sistine Chapel in the Vatican, and they looked up, and they saw that gigantic painting that Michelangelo drew, and you've probably seen it with you know, pointing to God with a finger, and it's huge. It's one of the major arts of the uh, Renaissance. Anyway, that huge painting, and she says, um, she says, do you realize, she told her grandmother, that piece of art that Michelangelo did took four years to paint. And the grandmother says, oh my, he and I must have the same landlord. <laughs> or former landlord. <laughs> four years to paint the ceiling. <laughs> and uh, my only point to make <laughs> in that stupid story is, doesn't the world seem to have the same landlord? You'll find the same pagan stuff everywhere. Everybody keeps the winter solstice. They may use different definitions, like academia no longer calls it Christmas because they don't, they, don't, they don't want the Bible or Christ in anything. They call it the winter holiday. And they call it in spring, it's the spring holiday or the, or the winter solstice. They take any religion out of it. They even have a new name, kind of a weird name for Good Friday. They're taking the religion out, which I think actually makes it worse. You take all of Luke and the Bible out, it actually goes from bad to worse, but you can debate that a little bit. Um, but the pagan traditions are worldwide. It's like the devil is everywhere, and, and you just uh, see it. We have to stick with God's holy days, which have a theme. It starts with the sacrifice of Christ, becoming pure and leaven. We being the first harvest, the first of the first fruits, Jesus Christ. And, and then you get to the fall holy days, the return of Christ. And, and it has a theme and a meaning. Um, and we believe Christ was born, well, we know he's born in the fall. The fact that God did not say celebrate his birthday per se means God wants us to put the focus on um, his second coming, I mean, we, we focus on his sacrifice, don't get me wrong, but on his second coming. Um, I'm not saying his first coming was unimportant, but on his second coming. And there's a scripture that I've always found very enlightening. It's Mark 2, about 24 to 27. In this particular one, uh, the, the scribes and Pharisees see Christ's disciples walking through the grain field. And by the way, they allowed people to keep the corners of their field and the extra grain available to the people who didn't have any food. That was what farmers were supposed to do. So they went through the corners of the field and they were getting grain and you know rubbing it chaff off and eating it. They didn't have a lot of fast food places like today. <laughs> Actually, if they were traveling with Christ, they were doing the work of God, but the Pharisees probably wouldn't see that. But <clears throat> they said, hey, uh, and I assume it goes something like this. The Pharisees have all these extra laws they got whole books of extra laws. They really do. You can just read about it. So it's not just the Bible. It's all the other extra laws. And they had some rules. I think over 620 rules regarding the Sabbath. And I think there was a limit. You maybe could get a few grains and eat them. But if you got maybe a, several big handfuls, you're now harvesting. You realize that's not harvesting. And they, the rules are outrageous. You couldn't. You couldn't uh, squeeze a flea until he bit you. If it was on the Sabbath, you had to prove he was dangerous first. Uh, and if you were a tailor, you couldn't put a, uh, the needle in your pocket during the Sabbath because you might be tempted to sew something up. I mean, these wheels are so weird that if it goes, it, you're like, wow. And um, well, I've told you something about some of the Hasidic Jews have some weird stuff in America and things that they do. And they're kind of the modern day equivalent of the um, Pharisees. And Christ says something that's really revealing. I'm going to read it. Mark 2, 26. And David ate the showbread that, you know, it wasn't lawful to eat except for the priest. And he also gave some to those who were with him. In other words, what he's saying is, if you look at what was written, God made exceptions to even the showbread law, because that was bread only for the priest to eat. It was part of the sacrificial system because David had an emergency. God is a little more flexible. That's what he's saying, and it's clear by the context that God didn't condemn it and God was with David. 
And then he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And you realize the, the way the religious leaders were handling their religion, the people were burdensomely serving the Sabbath instead of the Sabbath serving them. In other words, God's law is for the good of mankind. The Sabbath is supposed to give you the physical rest, maybe some mental rest. You're not under the same stress your job might give you. And you spend time with God. Like, like if you have a girlfriend and you're courting her, you've got to spend a certain amount of time to make it work, you know, I guess to sell the deal, as you say. I mean, the girls might say the same thing. Well, you got to spend time with God, and God requires it every week. That's good for us. I mean, obviously, God wants you to do it, but it's good for us. You realize that God's in heaven, all-powerful and mighty. Nothing you can do or not do is really going to harm him, is it? If you run around doing pagan stuff or not keeping the Sabbath or giving God none of your time, is God diminished in the least? Now, he may be sad because of your behavior. I mean, there's scriptures that show that he does care about mankind, but God isn't diminished. That Sabbath law is for us. It's for our benefit. Every, anything God says, like the, the, the land Sabbath law, which sounds minor, but people tell me that farmers rest part of their field every six year, and the soil rebuilds itself. You don't work it to death, and the soil stays healthy, we had this, this is back when we were in Clarksville, this one guy, he, had, he was just big and organic farming. And we saw his garden. He had thick black soil that's like this thick and with squishy. And everything he grew in there was beautiful and big. In other words, the point is people would have healthier food and we'd be healthier. Um, I know that's a minor law. Most people say, that's a minor law. But it's really good for people's health to have healthy soil. Now, I know they have chemical fertilizers. And that does some of it, uh, but still, resting the land is the best. And plowing under your, um, like my aunt was telling me, she was saying, as far as gardening, you know, the, the stems that you cut down from the tomato plants, you know, chop those up and bury it. She says, also, paper from your shredder. Bury that paper when you're tilling the garden for a year. That paper breaks down over several years because it's basically wood. And it'll build up your garden. Well, that's really what the land Sabbath was supposed to do. In other words, everything God said to do was good for us. Everything God said not to do was bad for us. And you just got to realize that, because right now, oh, Christmas is so wonderful, right? <laughs> and I understand it, it looks that way. Let's talk about the Christmas tree for a minute. Um, do you realize that by putting the presents under the Christmas tree, and by decorating it, putting it in a prominent place, isn't that the same thing as worshiping the tree? Because the reason they originally did it was so the kids would think, the tree gave you these wonderful gifts. The tree is the fountain of life. So the gifts are under the tree. Well, people say, well, we know that's not true now. It's just a human tradition. But it pulls people more toward nature worship. Because a lot of paganism is built around nature worshiping. The sun, the moon, the stars, uh, animus. This kind of religion is based on the spirit of the bear, the spirit of the wolf. and all. The, even rivers are worshipped, like the Nile. Well, that's really weird stuff. But this is the kind of thing that God doesn't want human beings to do because the more you get into it, even if it's just a compromise, it pulls us further from God and it's bad for society. I think it makes children greedy because the whole point of the 10th commandment is not to covet. Now, I'm going to admit I was a bad kid. Now, don't follow any of my examples. I was a bad kid. And I grew up in some bad circumstances, which I won't go into right now. My mom had a lot of trouble, so I had to live with my grandparents. And the kid next door was a dentist's uh, uh, son. I didn't want to go into all the details, but he got fabulous gifts on Christmas, and I got underwear and socks. Can you imagine how mad that made me? And then Van got some other good things. I won't go into it. I actually understand uh, some of the problems that my grandparents said, so I'm not trying to be too hard. But when you're a kid, you don't think that way. And I was covetous. Look at what he's got, and I don't have it. Look at what he's got, and I don't have it. Christmas made you jealous and angry and you felt well 
Now you're going to say, but a lot of kids didn't feel that way. Yes, but maybe other problems got them. They got all these toys, and I saw this too. They didn't appreciate all the stuff they got. And three or four weeks stuff that I wanted, it was in the closet half broken. I don't know. And it, was, it made kids unappreciative, greedy, and covetous. That's not good for kids. And I remember uh, when Chuck was like three years old, we lived in Austin, our first house. The lady next door, Rylan was the kid's name, uh, Chuck was bugging us about, oh, I want some more Star Wars toys. He didn't have all that much. We weren't that big on toys, especially this time of year. He said, but Ryland's got everything. And we chuckled. That's not really true. So we got to, he had me go over to Ryland's house once. His mother had an extra bedroom dedicated to his toys. He had a, he had a, a <clears throat> he had a Darth Vader, well, it looked like it was this big. That was a big thing in those days for little kids. And that big rocket ship that San Holo, Solo pilot did, it had a big one of those. And, and almost everything, and they were hard to get in those days. Look at what he's got, and look at what I don't have. <laughs> and uh, well, anyway, we probably didn't really have a good answer for Chuck, <laughs> the truth is. Um, but the point is, I would argue that Rylan was a spoiled brat. And you're like, well, you can't really say that. You're judging other people's kids. Well, maybe so. But I'm giving you an honest person's opinion of what I saw and what I felt. I don't think all the spoiling people do with their kids is good for them. So some get spoiled and others get angry and covetous. But is that good for society? And a lot of the Christmas parties, at least that's what they used to be known for. Now with the days of COVID, they're not supposed to have any. I'll bet you the top politicians will secretly have some. You wait and see. And it'll come out and you'll be shocked. They have a lot of drinking and bad stuff happens. That's the world we live in. It's not good for people. Psalms 15, 3 and 4. He who does not backbite with his tongue, nor does evil to his neighbor, nor does he take up reproach against his friend, in whose eyes a vile person is despised. But he honors those who fear the Lord. He who swears to his own hurt and does not change. The point I'm emphasizing is to his own hurt. In other words, the ones who are doing the bad stuff, it's to their harm. You think the thief is the winner, the guy who has defrauded people of money and does bad stuff? In the long run, he's paranoid about getting caught. His life is undermined. People who do evil might appear to us, especially when you're young, they're getting away with it. But it's really to their harm. Everything God says not to do, even if we can't see it, because God sees the long game, is bad. Everything God says to do is good for us. We cannot see it. So as we get close to the end of the sermon, I just want to emphasize God's holy days are guardrail. And that includes the weekly Sabbath. They're meant to channel us closer and closer and closer and closer to God. Remember Constantine was a sun worshiper. And this season is a compromise with pagan sun worship. S-U-N, not S-O-N, S-U-N. Uh, and the people mean well, so I'm not saying don't be nice to people who say Merry Christmas or mean to them. They mean well. I'm not asking us to be afraid of Christmas or against Christmas. I'm just saying from a teaching point of view, recognize it's not good for the country. People might think it's good because, you know, the music is beautiful and the decorations are beautiful and the Christmas trees are bright and you got the star at the top and... Um, some of that relates to angelic, angel worship and other pagan stuff and tree worship. Um, it's just not the truth. Um, and generally, if you tell people the truth, they close their ears. I don't want to hear it. By the way, that's one of the criticism that, that the prophets in Christ, who was quoting the prophets, told the Jewish leaders of his day. He said, you see with your eyes, you hear with your ears, but you don't really see anything. You don't really hear anything because your heart is hardened and you don't want to see it. That's probably true of most people we're going to meet in the world. So we need to kind of recognize that and try not to um, let it bother us. Um, and group pressure is a powerful thing. Uh, when Constantine made uh, his version of blending Christianity and sun worship, the official religion of 
that was basically the, the, the civilized world at the time, the Holy Roman Empire, it drove people further away from God. We want to stay close to God. Remember, Christmas trees and others have pagan roots, no matter how innocent they look. Um, and we know better, and we want to worship the true God in spirit and in truth. <laughs>